Everyone, this presentation will begin shortly. Uh, the session will be recorded and will last 60 minutes with about 45 minutes of presentation, followed by time for questions and answers. Please keep your microphone muted during the presentation and turn off your cameras. If you have a question or comment, enter it in the chat during the presentation and it will be addressed during the question and answer period. You may also ask questions with video during the question and answer portion. All participants in today's event will have access to the recorded version, which will be available within one week after the live event. My name is Joshua Gordon, and I will be the moderator for today's presentation. TESOL International Association Speech, Pronunciation, and Listening Interest section is pleased to present this webinar titled Integrated the Array of Technology with the System of Pronunciation toward an Agile Scrum Model. Our speaker today is Dr. D. Liu from Temple University. We are very pleased to welcome all of you to this webinar, and now I'll hand it over to our speaker. Thank you, Josh, and um, thank you everyone for joining me today and uh, for this opportunity to share some of my work. So I am going to share my screen and we will get started. Um, the title of my presentation is Integrating the Array of Technology with the System of Pronunciation Towards an Agile or Scrum Model. I know that some of you are probably not so familiar with what is Agile and Scrum, and we'll talk about it as we move on. So the agenda for today, I'll start with issues in second language pronunciation teaching. And I'll give a brief introduction or overview of complexity theory. Then I will talk about the Agile and Scrum model and how we can integrate this model in pronunciation teaching to facilitate teaching. And finally, I'll talk about the technological resources that we have and we are developing and envision pronunciation teaching in five or 10 years from right now. So the first issue, that I want to talk about is the lack of carryover into students' spontaneous language use outside of the language classroom. This is a issue that has been acknowledged by scholars. Judy Gilbert, for example, observed that students may walk out of the class without having accepted the system at all. By the system, she meant the intonation system. Or they may think intonation is simply decorative. Judy Gilbert's observation echoed what Ellen had noted half a century ago. There is little carryover into the students' own conversation outside the classroom. And the listening and repeat approach has never yielded satisfactory long-term results. But why? Some people may say, well, um, they probably just cannot produce it. They cannot produce um, sentence dress because maybe they don't have sentence dress in their first language. Or maybe their first language is a tone language and that has a very different pitch track um, with English. But it turns out that researchers found that O2 English speakers could successfully imitate native English speakers use of suprasegmental cues in making focus if they were asked to do so. And one of my early studies in 2018, um, I interviewed a language learner who said that when our teacher actually forced everyone, every student to pronounce like she does, everyone can do it. Everyone can do it just fine. So that leads us to this question. If they can do it, why, why don't they do it? Um, as Lucy Pickering acknowledged, a lot of the Chinese L2 English speakers' intonation remain flat and monotonous. But what's the problem? To see some of the challenges or difficulties that learners have, sometimes it's helpful to put ourselves into the role of a learner and experience it from a learner's perspective. 
So today I'm going to give you a Cantonese pronunciation 101 class. We are going to learn one word in Cantonese. And the word is English. In Cantonese, English sounds like Ying Man. Now, two syllables. The first syllable is Ying, and the second syllable is Man. The first syllable starts with a consonant that is a lateral approximant, similar to the consonant sound in the word yes, Ying. And the second one is similar to the English word men um, with a different vowel, a more reduced vowel, Ying Man. And that is the word. Now, I cannot hear you, but I'm going to ask you to repeat after me three times, okay? Ying Man. Ying Man. Ying Man. Okay, now you learn this word, okay? You know how to say English in Cantonese. But is it really? Now imagine you are a student and you took this Cantonese pronunciation 101 class thinking that you learned the word English. And then you walk out to the street and this is what you are going to hear. It's a running speech. It's a spontaneous speech with a lot of words that you haven't learned, with a lot of pronunciations that you're unfamiliar with. And the word that you know is mixed together in this running stream of speech. Why is that a problem? Now, I'm going to give you a task to do, okay? You, all of you learn this word, ying man. Now, I'm going to play this audio again. And I'm going to ask you to count how many times the word ying man appeared in this audio file, okay? And then you can simply type your answer in the chat, or you can put it down in a piece of paper. Now, we're going to listen to it again. That's the end. How many times? Again, you can put in the chat three times, three times, three times. Okay, a lot of you um, got the correct answer. It is three times. Okay, through this visualization of speech, we can see that there are three times when the word Ying Man appeared in this audio file. Uh, many people believe that English is very difficult. In fact, if you put English and Chinese together, English and Chinese actually have a lot of similarities. That's what this whole stream of speech is. But did you notice the tone difference? When I first taught you, I used Ying Man. In the audio file, it's Ying Man. There are actually two different dialects in Cantonese. And the first dialect, which is often used by the people from mainland uh, Guangdong uh, or adjacent provinces, the word is oftentimes pronounced as Ying Man with that more variabilities at the end of the word. In areas like Hong Kong and Macau, people tend to use Ying Man with a less varied um, pitch track. And I will play a sound file so you can hear the difference. When I teach you, I use the first one. When we're listening, we're listening to the second one. Ying Man. Ying Man. Right, as you can see, the first one is one dialect and the second one is a different dialect. Did you notice the tone difference? The fact that you didn't notice the tone difference probably is the same as how a 
L2 English speaker felt when learning about English intonation? They probably didn't know that intonation carries meanings. So it's important that we teach them and increase their metalinguistic awareness of the importance and functions of intonation. There are more problems or issues that hinder the application or transfer of classroom learned knowledge or skills to spontaneous speech outside of the classroom. And a paper that I collaborated with uh, Dr. Marnie Ree from Boston University, we stated that there are at least two levels of complexity involved in this application to spontaneous use of language. The first is structural complexity. As many of you know, the phenomenon that we call stress or focus um, is related to multiple acoustic features, including pitch, duration, and intensity. How to consolidate and use these three features together and manipulate them is one level of complexity that learners, uh, that learners face. Another layer of complexity is the functional complexity. It captured a close relationship and interaction among pronunciation, information structure, morphosyntactical structure, and phonological phenomena. What does it mean? Now, if we take a look at this um, Cantonese speech that we just heard, and we found that um, the pitch level, let's just focus on the blue lines right here, which demonstrates the pitch track of the speech. Although all these three are the same word, Yingmen or Yingmen, different dialects again, um, we can see that the pitch level actually are quite different, the pitch levels of these three Yingmen. The first one is at the level of about 180 hertz. The second one is about 150 hertz. And the last one is about um, 210 hertz. It turns out that the pitch is governed by a lot of um, acknowledged phenomena. For example, if we're presenting new information, we tend to use higher pitch level, um, a phenomenon that is often termed um, new versus given contrast. If we have contrastive information, um, we apply higher pitch level to uh, the contrastive information that we're going to present. And at the beginning of a sentence, the pitch level is usually quite high. And at the end, it's going to be lower, a, a phenomenon um, that we call declination. So there's a downtrend of your pitch level. Now, from the learner's perspective, well, um, it's, a, it's something that is, can be separated into different features, um, pitch, duration, intensity. And it's also governed by so many different phenomena and um, situations, information structures, uh, morphosyntactical structures. How do I navigate a space? Hold on. Now, another challenge is that one small change in the pitch track can lead to a drastic change at the system level. So if you look at these two sentences, the first one is, he said the third homework is due on Wednesday. And the second one is, he said the third homework is due on Wednesday. If we just look at these two sentences, the only thing that changed was the sentence rest placement. The first one is uh, third and the second one is Wednesday. But if you look at other words in the sentence, for example, he said, and he said right here, and is due on, or homework is due on, and here homework is due on. The pitch level of these words that are exactly the same are drastically different. But these things are actually the same in these two sentences. So one small change in the sentence can lead to a drastic change at the system level. Now, if you think about, if you think about it from a learner's perspective, Perhaps I learn the first one in classroom, 
But when I'm trying to apply it to express myself in a different way, I have to change not only the part I want to change, but also the whole pitch contour. And that is another level of difficulty. So one small change will lead to a drastic change. Doesn't that sound familiar? Some of you may have heard about this butterfly effect, which is probably the most well-known effect in complexity theory. And that's where we are getting to. Butterfly effect essentially says a butterfly flapping its wings can cause a tornado hundreds or thousands of miles away. So essentially, um, in weather forecast, a small change can lead to drastic change at the system level. Complexity theory has been introduced to the field of second language acquisition or second language development. Diane Larson Freeman, for example, stated that language is a complex adaptive system which emerges bottom up from interactions of multiple agents and speech communities rather than a static system composed of top-down grammatical rules or principles. Lawson Freeman was talking about language as a complex system, which deals with the study of complex, dynamic, nonlinear, self-organizing, open, emergent, sometimes chaotic, and adaptive system. And I will argue that pronunciation is also a complex system. So what exactly is a complex system? When we talk about complex system, a lot of time we use the metaphor birth lock um, to visualize it. So I'm going to play a very short video showing you the birth lock and how does it change. Okay, I think you get the idea. Beautiful, isn't it? Uh, a flock of birds um, flying freely in the sky, just like music, just like speech stream. And local changes can lead to a different shape of the bird flock, just like how the change of a stressed constituent can lead to the change of the pitch contour of the whole sentence. So that's why we're saying pronunciation is actually a complex system. So we have to manually move to the second slide. So the second issue is that pronunciation is a complex and dynamic system. You may wonder, but I get that pronunciation is a dynamic complex system, but why is that an issue? Let's do another activity. Um, in a former study that I um, collaborate with Alison McGregor, um, Beth Zielinski, Colleen Meyer, and then um, also uh, Marnie Reed, we collected 28 pronunciation related terms from 14 empirical studies published between 2007 and 16. And we also collected terms from three teacher training resource books and three student test books. And these are the terms, chunks, phrasing, tonality, tone unit, intonational phrase, pauses, primary stress, pitch accent, focus, nucleus, um, pitch contour, final in intonation, et cetera, et cetera. Now I'm going to ask you to do something very simple. Put the same or similar words together and explain the relationship among these terms. I'm going to give you about uh, around a minute to do it by yourself. Um, and then I'm going to show you some of the results that we had. So um, you can, either look at the screen and try to identify those terms that you will group together, or you can put them down on a piece of paper and try to 
um, put these terms in groups or identify the relationships around these terms. One minute. Okay, time's up. So I guess all of you have some way of sorting these terms. And so we presented these terms to six experienced ESL teachers teaching in two language institutions at two different universities. And we asked them to put the same or related words together and explain the relationships among them. And here you can see on the right-hand side of my screen, three different teachers' way of organizing these terms. You probably wouldn't be able to tell which term is which, but you can probably see from just the pattern of these terms that these three teachers have very different conceptualization of the system of pronunciation. The bottom one has four different columns. The top left part, um, the teacher organized these terms in small piles. And the top right one had two terms, um, pitch and focus in the middle and everything surrounding them. Very different ways of conceptualizing the system. And one teacher shouted out loud when sorting the term, they're all kind of related. Now we're not saying that one way or another way is the right way to um, put these terms or organize these terms. But let me ask you this question. If, if you ask an engineer, how does the engine of a car works? If you just interview 10 engineers, are they going to have different conceptualization? Well, maybe slightly different, but mostly their understanding will be consistent. The fact that different teachers have different conceptualization of the system of pronunciation shows that it's a complex and dynamic system. But why is that an issue? Well, what will happen if two teachers have different understanding of the same system, which will affect their teaching or influence how they introduce the system? to learners. That's the first issue. And the second part, this is another study um, that I did in which I investigate how different features, pronunciation features were used collectively in four different um, Korean O2 English speakers learning trajectory. So, um, the horizontal, the x-axis, or uh, week zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, so six weeks course. And the y-axis shows the maximum pitch level, um, which is one of the most prominent correlation of um, sentence stress. And we talk about different, uh, we talk about consonants and vowel in week one and week two. Week three, we talk about sentence stress. And as you can see, some um, people, some learners, um, their use of sentence stress rose in the week when the teacher focused on the teaching of sentence stress. But then after that, when the teacher talk about connected speech processes, when the teacher talk about other areas of pronunciation, um, their ability to effectively use sentence stress um, reduced or went back to the original level. So 
learners use of pronunciation features in a system involves multiple factors. And it's similar like a juggler perfor performing a circus trick. You know, he or she is throwing all these different bottles to the air. And these bottles are like consonants, vowels, intonation, stress, and rhythm. It's not like they're only focusing on one, but they have to organically and systematically control all these aspects. Not to mention that we're only focusing on pronunciation right here. We haven't even talked about the functional complexity, which has relation to do with what vocabulary are you going to use? What morphosyntactical structure are you going to use? All these levels are complexities that a learner would have to manage when applying classroom learn knowledge or skills to spontaneous speech. No wonder they cannot do it. Now, whenever I talk about this, when I were I introduce complexity theory in my course, second language development, I always got the same question from my students. And the question is, um, yeah, I agree. It, it seems like you have you made a great argument that pronunciation is a complex dynamic system. And in a complex dynamic system, there is no rule. Right, we, we, we cannot identify, say, if you are going to stress this word, you increase pitch by 50% and you increase duration by 30%. That, that's not the case. So what do we do? What do we do as teachers? How can we manage the level of difficulty inherent to the pronunciation system? How do we do that? So our third issue is, Teachers lack pedagogical methods, approaches, and tools that can manage the complex and dynamic pronunciation system. My answer is technology. And we have great technology that can assist the teachers in managing complexity at multiple levels. And we are also developing new technology that will help teachers in a more systematic way. So just to name a few of my favorite um, technological resources, Sounds of Speech is um, a, an application, an app that you can download on your phone, and then you can see the articulatory process, how people use different speech organs to make a particular sound. English Accent Coach is a website developed by Ron Thompson. Um, it uses um, high variability input um, to test learners' perception of individual sounds, and it generates a report card that shows you which are the sounds that um, different L1 learners may have difficulties perceiving. Uglish is a tool that I learned from John Levis, and since I learned it in 2016 or 2017, it became one of my favorite tools. And this Uglish website will allow you to put in some keywords or phrases um, like, how is it going? And it's going to search within its database. A lot of these videos are um, TED Talks or YouTube videos. And then it's going to direct the user directly to the episode with this particular case, with this particular phrase. Um, for example, the one that we're showing on the screen is how is it going? And it's going to show you 1,673 videos with this phrase, and it's going to uh, give you also the transcript of them. And finally, last but not the least, uh, we are developing a software. Um, it's going to be available soon called Speech Artist, in which we put um, multiple phonological phenomena and pronunciation features together to visualize the speech or the speech stream. So these tools will change the landscape of pronunciation teaching. But how? How do we integrate an array of these tools to a complex and dynamic system of pronunciation? First of all, I argue that we need to collaborate 
with software developers. For example, um, when we developed Speech Artist, uh, this speech visualization software, I collaborated with a postdoctoral fellow at um, Stanford University, Dr. Tao Wang, and um, we adopted a complexity theory approach. And the purpose, the, the our primary goal is to integrate as many features as possible within one figure. For example, as you can see, um, this is just a one episode of the speech. The whole sentence is, um, the only per am, I, am I the only person who prefers clouds to blue skies? And this is clouds to blue skies. The bubble or these um, balls will show you how long the syllable is. And we also put phonetic transcription within the bubbles, the balls, and also um, transcripts and phonetic transcription at the bottom part of the figure. And as you can see, cloud is longer than two and two is shorter than blue. And the um, position of the syllables um, show the pitch level. So this um, green line right here is showing the pitch track of this. Am I the only one who prefer, pr prefer clouds to blue sky? As you can see, that sky goes really high. So we integrate um, pitch as showing, uh, as demonstrated by the relative positions at the y-axis, uh, duration as, demonstra as demonstrated by the diameter of the circle, and then um, intensity as demonstrated by the color of these um, of, of, of these um, syllables. And we also integrated phonetic transcriptions. If the phonetic transcription is wrong, if the machine detected that there is a mispronunciation, it's going to put things in red color, as you can see in this figure right here. That's where it had difficulties perceiving the sound. So by integrating complexity theory approach in software development, we will be develop software with complexity theory approach. But we also need a higher level pedagogical model that can help us to integrate the whole array of technology within pedagogy, uh, within pedagogical pa practice. So I want to introduce waterfall versus agile or scrum model. Now let's um, let's um, move from pronunciation to engineering, say for a moment. Okay, let's say we are going to build a car. Okay, we're we're going to build a electric car, for example, a EV, electric vehicle. We have two options if you think about it. Um, we can either use the waterfall model, which is the sort of old model. All these big companies, they used to use this model. So first we gather requirement gathering and analysis, and then we design the system, and then we implement it, we test it, we develop, and, and, and we do maintenance, right? So we can, for, for example, design the best engine that we can have, best transmission system that we can have, best tires that we can have, and then we put them together. Hopefully we'll get the best performance. That's one way to do it. The problem is this oftentimes takes years to do. A model that's getting more and more popularity is the Agile or Scrum model. So instead of say, let's try to build the best engine, let's try to build the best transmission system, we say, well, let's just build a prototype of it. Maybe a toy electric vehicle that we can sell it to, to um, three-year-old, five-year-olds and see how they, how they work. You know, you, you have a prototype. And then you found that, okay, the engine needs to be improved. And then you take out the engine, you try to improve it and put it back and run the car again. And then you found that, okay, the transmission system would need to be improved. And then you take out the transmission system, optimize it and put it back and test the speed of the car again. So as you can see, it's very different models. And in many different areas, we're moving from waterfall model to the agile 
and scrum model. So in a um, in a element that we wrote um, with Tamara Jones and Marnie Reed, um, we make this argument that we need to shift the pedagogical model from a more waterfall type of teaching to this more agile type of teaching. How does it, how, how do these two different models differ? Well, in agile, everything begins with assessment of interlanguage. We assume the student have an interlanguage, which is a prototype. It's like that toy electric vehicle. And that's the beginning. And then we spend one or two weeks focusing on one aspect of it, probably individual sounds. And we can still do these mini lessons um, focusing on individual sounds or sound pairs. And then we do the assessment of interlanguage again. And next cycle, we can focus on prosody or uh, super segmental features. And again, we have different mini lessons focusing on syllable structure, word stress, and rhythm, and the assessment of interlanguage at the end. So you may say, well, um, yes, waterfall and agile or scrum are two different models, but it sounds like they both ask me to teach individual features. So how, how do they how do they differ? The traditional approach, phonetics and phonological features are taught mostly in isolation, and the system emerges at the end of the teaching period. Um, what this is saying is that if you think about the curriculum, the traditional pronunciation curriculum, we teach consonants, and then we teach vowels, and then we teach um, syllable structure, and then we teach stress, one feature at the time. And the assumption seems to be, okay, by the end, the students will integrate everything and he or she will be able to um, improve his or her pronunciation at the system level. But as we saw, learners oftentimes don't do that. They, their ability to use sentence stress increased when teachers talked about it, and then it relapsed after they shift to different features of pronunciation. Whereas in the Agile or Scrum approach, phonetics and phonological features are taught as a whole system with multiple subsystems. And the systems, although not mature, exists at the beginning of the teaching period. So we're trying to optimize an already existed system. In the traditional approach, progress is characterized by adding new knowledge. So um, let's say you don't know much about um, consonants. So first we, we add consonants, second we, we add vowel. And the third week, we add syllable structure to your knowledge set. In Agile or Scrum, that's different. Um, in Agile or Scrum, we're st we can still focus on different features for every single week, but the conceptualization is at the development, uh, is at the system level. So we're thinking more about um, system 1.0, 1.1.1, 1.1.2, uh, and then system 2.0. 2.1.1, 2.1.2. Yes, as you can see, um, probably tell from the way that I'm uh, introducing this, software development is the industry that uses Agile or Scrum model a lot. And another key difference between the traditional approach and the Agile or Scrum approach is assessment. In traditional approach, assessment focuses on individual features after small learning cycles. So after we introduce consonants, and let's see if you can perceive consonants. Let's see if you can correctly output or produce uh, minimal pairs. And you can do it. Okay, the assumption is that you already learned um, consonants, just like how you learned um, the word ying mun at the beginning of this talk. In the agile model, that's different. Assessment is also conducted at the whole system level although feedback is provided for the subsystems. So we can still do the invitation repetition, but that's just the first step. The assessment that we really care about is when students are using ying mun or that word in a spontaneous production of speech. Are they able to use that? And the assessment, the final assessment that signals or signifies improvement is always at the system level. I want to know if students are able to use sentence stress together with 
all the other phon uh, phonological and pronunciation features. It is great that my students can use pitch in isolation, but what I really care about is students, can students use the right pitch level considering all these information structures, morphosyntactical structures and meaning. Assessment is so important. And uh, we are going to talk about a innovative way to conduct assessment, which is automated speech recognition. Automated speech recognition has been used in language teaching a lot um, in different aspects, teaching, assessment, and uh, feedback. But there are issues. For example, speech is transcribed at the word level rather than at the sound level. So um, I remember some researchers used uh, available ASR devices or software like Google Voice Typing um, to assess students' pronunciation, which is great. But the, the way that we can see is that students mispronounce a word, but we cannot really know which sound is wrong, is mispronounced. And error sounds are often hidden or corrected because the purpose of general ASR, automated speech recognition, it's, it is designed to transcribe speech as accurate or as correct as possible. It makes predictions. But in pronunciation teaching, we actually want the device to review the errors that the learners are making. And last but not the least, the ASR model is often based on native speakers model such as the timid acoustic phonetic continuous speech corpus. And we need a more multilingual model. So um, what I envision as ASR 2.0 is a students assessment for pronunciation, which will um, provide feedback at um, the phoneme level. And it's going to consolidate data to show which sounds are problematic um, and is going to provide feedback to help teachers in identifying errors and teach errors. And this is just a um, machine learning model that I was training. Um, last but not the least, um, I this semester, I try to teach my students who are student teachers, these are graduate um, students enrolled in our TESOL program, to teach language in the metaverse or using virtual reality. Um, this is a workshop that we, that we did. Um, we asked students to um, try to use Oculus Quest 2. And then this is a video that one of my students recorded. Um, Philadelphia Eagles, I think, it, it, it was having a match with another team. And he recorded um, a 360 degree video. As you can see, this is uploaded to um, YouTube and you can actually um, have immersive experience. So wearing this um, Oculus goggle, you can experience the actual match and then you can feel these people screaming and shouting, um, having conversations at, in that particular field. And this is a teacher uh, giving a lecture uh, or organizing a lesson in the um, Allspace VR, which is a uh, quote unquote metaverse um, <clears throat> use. So what I like is this virtual reality, including all, all these games, like um, the, the premature version of, of metaverse, you, can, you may say it's the Second Life or other games. Um, I like the fact that um, it, it, these technology helps us to break the barrier of um, physical boundaries. So we, we can put students from different parts of the world in one space, in one metaverse, and then give them opportunities to use language authentically, to use authentic language to communicate with different people. So we have a lot of technological resources. Under the Agile or Scrum model, we're assuming that the student already have a prototype of language. 
And our goal is not to add something, not only to add information to that system, but also to improve that system through fast iteration. Technological tools can be used to integrate and facilitate that approach by creating a virtual space where we can have students to use language spontaneously and by using ASR-based assessment tools to provide evaluation and feedback to learners. In this case, in, this, in these situations, technology helps teachers to manage the complexity of the pronunciation system. So <clears throat> the review of our agenda, we talk about three issues. The lack of carryover, complex and dynamic nature of pronunciation, and the lack of pedagogical tools. We talk about one theory, which is complexity theory. Language is viewed as a complex and dynamic system that's constantly changing. And there is no rules that we can govern how different pronunciation features are interfering or um, are influencing each other. We talk about one model, Agile or Scrum, and we talk about two technological directions, virtual reality and AI-based students assessment. The key takeaways are, first of all, from the complexity theory perspective, language is a complex and dynamic system consisting of multiple interrelated and interwoven variables. Think about pitch and how many pronunciation features are related to pitch. A language system emerges from the interaction of these variables. Some of the linguistic variables cannot be described using a rule-based system or a mathematical formula, causing difficulties to the application of classroom knowledge to spontaneous language use. Even if we could, say we could identify a relationship between pitch and duration, it would be impossible for a language learner or a speaker to analyze it before uh, saying or using language every time. And finally, second language acquisition can be seen as an optimization process of an immature model, i.e. students' interlanguage system. Assessment of spontaneous language uses is needed. L teachers will need to think beyond language classroom and consider how dynamic language use can be cultivated and improve outside of a classroom setting. Thank you very much. And uh, these are the work referred in the, um, um, in the talk. Thank you very much. And let's take some questions. Thank you, Dr. D. Liu for this presentation. And now uh, please feel free to ask your question. Uh, we have one here that says, uh, what is speech artist written in uh, and where to find more information about it? Um, sorry, I, I, so um, speech artist? Yes, the application that you mentioned, speech artist. Oh, uh, what is um, it written in? Speech Back end, front end. Yes, yes, thank you. Thank you for the question. Um, Speech Artist is a software that I developed with a uh, collaborator. Um, it is um, current. So we, we first developed it as an application that you can download and, and install in your computer. But then we later also receive a lot of feedback from users saying that they had difficulties um, using, the, using the application in different systems, PC, Macintosh, et cetera. So we're now... Um, we're now putting it online. So it should be available um, before or early January next year. But if you type just speechartist.com, we already bought that domain name and we are um, putting it online. But um, it's, a, it's going to be a website where you can upload your speech and it will generate a picture like the one that I show you. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we have more comments here. Thanking you for the presentation. Thank the you very much. Thank you, everyone. Yep. Well, I oh. do have one quick question. Do you have any suggestions for teacher trainers as to how to 
implement this approach for a pronunciation teaching training for future Thank teachers of pronunciation. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for that question. I, I was actually hoping that someone will bring up that question. And that, that is something that I am also working on uh, with some of my students. Um, I think technology use have the, the current application of technology. I could be wrong, but I feel like um, people, when people were thinking about how to use technology and pronunciation teaching, many people think it in either in terms of how to use a software within classroom teaching or um, completely self-directed by students like these apps designed for students. Mm -hmm. I've been looking to see how we can um, integrate pedagogical approach with technology. So there must be a role <laughs> of teacher in um, navigating, directing, supervising students' learning. But as teachers, we also need to acknowledge that there are all these technological resources available either within or outside of the classroom. And we need to um, make them available to learners and help learners to, um, to use them. So to go back to your question, I think A, more technological resources need to be integrated in the curriculum. Like in many of my courses, I talk about, I introduce all these um, different technological resources to my um, master's students. Mm -hmm. And the second thing is um, connecting theories with practice. For, for all of our courses, we have a fieldwork or a practicum component, which um, teachers are supposed to use what they learn in the classroom to their practice. I found it very helpful. Um, for example, the Metaverse um, study, we collaborated with our language center, uh, TCAL at Temple University, and our teachers are uh, offering this as an elective course to their students. And um, in that process, our teachers learn a lot and they, they started to see what are the um, caveats of using technological resources and how they can effectively integrate agile model and also technological resources in a lesson. I have to say there is no one way to do it. Mm -hmm. Teachers will need a period of time to, um, to find the optimal way to integrate technological resources into different types of existing curriculum. Mm -hmm. I, I hope I answer your question. Yeah, absolutely. And we have a couple of more questions here. Sure. Uh, the first one says, how does L2 acquisition and the prosodic hierarchy fit into the scrum model? For instance, nuclear stress and the third person final S sounds are notoriously acquired late in the process. For example, Mur Murphy's study of Javier Bardem's use of contrastive stress. Right. Thank you so much. That That is a very good question. Um, the Agile or Scrum model is not to refute any of the existing teaching. I would rather envision it as an extra layer on top of the existing teaching. Namely, we need to go beyond having students imitate things and uh, reproduce classroom provided examples. We need to go beyond that. Mm -hmm. And the, the, the problem that, um, that is identified that um, you know some sounds or some features are notorious um, for their difficulties in, in acquiring. I think these features, we can teach them, but we don't have to expect learners to be able to use everything right away. Just like if you think about a juggler, right? Um, the juggler doesn't also make mistakes, right? You don't expect a juggler to every time able to play like 10 bottles, throw 10 bottles in the air and, and manage to control everything. You know, uh, sometimes people just drop the ball and that happens a lot, especially at the learner's level. But the most important thing to understand is if they are unable to use some features in their spontaneous speech, then this feature is not quote unquote learned. It's not like if a learner can, uh, explicitly stay the rule of third person singular S and use it in classroom examples, then they can transfer it or you can use it to in spontaneous speech. If they're not using it, 
it means that we need to still put some efforts in improving it. Nothing is going to be perfect at the first time. And the Agile and Scrum model is actually a approach acknowledging that. Okay, if we're building a car, nothing is perfect. We need continuous improvement through fast iteration. Again, I hope I answered the question. <laughs> um, we, have a, we have a couple of more questions here. Yeah. One says, uh, have you implemented the Scrum system in teaching pronunciation? If yes, do you use ASR assessment? And if yes, how do you use the results? Do you um, see any carryover? Thank you for the for the for the question. I am collaborating with um, some teachers, both within the U.S. and in other countries, to implement the Scrum uh, approach in language teaching. One thing that I found is that different curriculum. Um, will require teachers to apply or integrate a Scrum model in different ways. So if we are talking about a in uh, some Asian countries like China, Korea, and, and Japan, the educational system, the K-12 educational system is highly um, influenced by the college entrance exam. In, in that case, the, the way how people integrate Scrum model is going to be quite different from my students who is teaching um, in the language institution in the US. So the answer is yes, we're doing it, but um, it's more complicated than I thought initially. And I will report the results as soon as it's available in the form of either um, presentations or a paper. And um, to answer your second question, yes, I think ASR assessment is necessary. Um, but I don't think ASR assessment is optimal at this time. So I will recommend using ASR with other types of assessments. So um, we may use ASR or integrate ASR as one method of assessment, but teachers still play a very important role, critical role in and outside of the language classroom. Mm -hmm. Okay, and we have another question. It says, uh, the example of the two different pronunciations of the word for English in Cantonese illustrate how common pronunciation variation is, which is relevant not only between dialects, but also between speaker identities, for example, gender, race, and class. When you're developing software like speech artists, how do you account for this variation when considering what good pronunciation sounds like and what problematic pronunciation sounds like? Thank you for the question again. That's a great question. And that is exactly <laughs> the, the question that I am, um, I'm having a, a little bit of difficulties um, developing um, software uh, with. So, my argument is, so, so the short answer to this question is current language models, uh, ASR language models are not ideal from my perspective, especially in terms of um, the variety um, of speech, the, taking into consideration the multi, uh, multilingual approach. The developmental difficulties, the biggest developmental difficulty is to decide how to train a machine model. So for example, if I want to create a multilingual model, I have different plans, right? I, I can either use 200 native speakers model and then enter it into the system and, and, and train a um, language model, or I can use 200 nat quote unquote L1 native speakers and then um, uh, 200 speakers from different uh, speaking uh, 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 who are L1 speakers of different dialects, and then um, also 200 speakers of other uh, languages like Chinese, Arabic, Spanish speakers. But we don't really have data as how these different models or different data um, trained machine learning models will make a difference. Um, one solution that we're thinking is that we may train different models and ask speakers to select um, based on their different needs. For example, I want to sound like, uh, I, I envision that I will go to UK, so I want to um, use a more UK-based model um, to do the assessment. 
um, if I want to go to India, I'll use more like a India uh, Indian approach to Indian um, variety of English to train my perception and production to assess my production. That is one solution. But the problem is that solution, um, the problem that we're facing is the lack of data. Um, and as you know, to train a machine learning model, we'll have to have enormous amount of data and the shortage of data and a particular variety of English or um, particular accent or uh, dialect of English is, is the major problem uh, for creating that kind of model. So that's, that's it. the answer is yes, that's a big question. And uh, we are working on it. And by saying we, I mean um, my colleague and I, and also other researchers and scholars that I, that I know who are working in this area, um, things are improving. And um, I, I do believe that we'll have more multilingual based um, language assessment model in the near future. Um, but there are issues that we're trying to solve uh, from a technological or software developer's perspective. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. Well, it looks like there are no more questions. Okay, so, so uh, mm -hmm. yes, go thank ahead. Thank you so much. Um, thank you so much, everyone, for your fabulous questions and for your kind words and positive comments. Um, I hope that my um, speech will give you some thoughts, and I invite all of you to uh, collaborate and to, uh, if you're interested in the topic, to explore possible. Um, software development and implication of Agile, Scrum, or any um, technological software or websites. I think this is a um, collaborative effort that we're envisioning. And that is going to really bring us to the future of pronunciation teaching. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. And thank you again, um, Josh and Nancy, for inviting me and offering me this valuable opportunities to talk about my work. Thank you very much. And this brings us to the conclusion of today's webinar, Integrating the Array of Technology with the System of Pronunciation for an Agile Scrum Model. A very special thank you to our presenter, Dr. D. Liu. And this concludes the webinar. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.